Thanks, Warren. So I'm not going to talk about um, pastors in this session. I'm going to look at some of the influences that governors and owners of some of the largest and most progressive corporate farms in this country make um, in response to pressures both internally from their owners and also in response to um, increasing restrictions both through um, legislation and, and, and regulation. And as all of you will understand, the difference between Māori farming and the rest of the farming sector is that Māori farms have multiple owners and in some cases a very large number of owners. All right, so I'm going to um, use an example that goes back to 2010. Some of you will have seen this, this slide where uh, Lake Rotorua was under pressure and one of the scenarios was to remove 350 tonnes by getting rid of all the dairy farms in the catchment and drastically reducing uh, livestock farms. And so that went down a treat uh, with uh, all the farmers in the catchment. Uh, but I want to point to one farm that was uh, a dairy farm during this time, during this scenario, but um, this one here. And they made the decision in 2007 to exit, exit their, their dairy farm that it was established in 19, 1986. And they did that based on their understanding that it was the right thing to do. They'd seen the numbers from the early um, regional council modelling and uh, they'd also had some pressure from their owners. And so they, they got out. And if those of you um, think back to the, the milk solids price in, in 2007, I think it, it, it almost hit $8 then. So they had some criticism, but they're still wearing today around the decision to, uh, to exit. Um, but the other pressure that they were facing was from their land-owning group. And on the left-hand uh, box there, we have, a, we have a list of what we call hapū. And these are, uh, these are the, <coughs> uh, the hokainga or the ahikā, uh, the, the original uh, owners who have, who have owned um, land around the lake, around their marae, but also in this incorporation, in this... Oh, I tried to use a pointer. Um, I won't do that. Um, and the, the, the expectation from the owners as well was that they had to do better. All right? So they jumped ahead of the, the general trends in the, um, in the Lake Rotorua catchment. Here's another catchment here, uh, another one that is under stress uh, the, at the um, estuary end of, of Kaituna River. <coughs> and this farm on the left-hand side is a, is a tribally owned dairy farm. It's one of the largest and most progressive in that, in that area. And they too, questions have been asked by the tribal owners around how they're mitigating the impacts from this, from this dairy farm into this estuary. This estuary is, was at one time considered a food basket for, um, for this area. So um, regenerative agriculture has been uh, mentioned this, this, this morning. This organization is now looking at alternatives, not only organics and, and looking at a, a regenerative system, but also horticulture, right, and moving from intensive horticulture. But the question is not so much around what do we need to do to stay as farmers, but what do we need to do to design the landscape that delivers to social, uh, environmental, and cultural outcomes. And so here we've got a, an example of a, a dairy farm in the eastern Bay of Plenty that is fortunate enough to be located in a, in a region or, or the, the district that has infrastructure that allows them to, to look at uh, horticulture, all right? High entry cost to it, uh, and Phil and the, the Ag First team and the Scion team have done the, done the numbers on that, but this was around providing options to this uh, board of directors to understand what their options are to not only move towards the, the zero carbon targets and reductions in methane and nitrous oxide, but also how do, you, how do you look at designing a landscape that delivers more? This is my, my last slide, Warren. Um, so the title in the, in the program is around collectives. 
right? And here are, here are two collectives that are part of a, uh, a waka, as we call it. So when the, when, this, when the ancestors of the owners of these lands landed in uh, Maketu, which is, if I can get this pointer going right. Oh, I'm pointing the wrong one. Okay, so Maketu is up here. Uh, the ancestors at that time split. One settled here around Rotorua, and we, we, they call themselves Te Arawa, and that is my lot. And the, the, the others settled around Taupo. Now, those of you who are looking at the numbers will, um, will now see that I've, a, I've actually got the, the arrows pointing in the wrong direction. So the larger uh, 281,000 hectares uh, belongs to Tuwharetoa. But the key part of this is that pasture is an important part of their overall system. All right? And when they look at the, the, the profile of their, their land use, right, horticulture, sorry, pastoral agriculture fits alongside trees. They've got huge investments in trees. So with, with the, the Chaudawa lot, which is this one up here, uh, the pasture is around 30% uh, of the total. With, with the Tuwharetoa down here, it's less than 10%. Right? And you can see the numbers there around native and, and pre uh, 1990 forestry, so the questions have been asked around ETS and so what's where the liability really sits when if they look at it at a collective basis, right, they're looking pretty good, right, in terms of, uh, in terms of carbon balance. But what is taking up most of the energy with these two groups is how do you collaborate, how do you design production systems where you can build scale, all right? So we have got a group up in the up here, uh, that is now looking at uh, a significant dairy sheep collective, and down here in Topo, there are now those collective owners that are looking at biofuels, bioenergy, and bioproducts. All right, to, to looking across farm boundaries. So I'm I'm not talking about an individual farmer, uh, with individual farmers that are trying to understand where they fit into the sector on their own. These are, these are large organizations. The, the, the Tauruwa group is uh, 40 organizations own 80% of the land. And down here, uh, 27 entities, this is 280,000 hectares, 27 entities uh, control and own the pastoral farms over 80 hectares. So we're not talking about a large number of farms, but they're, they're, they're very significant and they've got scale. So they're looking at understanding how they can move, not as individuals, but as, as collectives. And the pasture resilience and understanding the pasture systems is critical to this because these farmers, of all the examples that I've given you, are not, they're not looking at exiting farming. They're, they're, they're wanting to understand how, does the, how, does the, how do the animal system systems fit into si inside a wider landscape. Shall I leave it there, Ryan? Thank you.